welcome to Harvest Baptist Church. It's good to be in the Lord's house yes. today. Amen. Yes. The beginning of a new week. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. Amen. 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 I'm thankful for that. It's a new week, the beginning of the week. The weekend is Friday and Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Why do we go to church on the first day of the week? Because upon, early upon the first day of the week, the Lord Jesus raised from the dead. And uh, the principle was set in motion for the assembly of a New Testament church be upon the first day of the week. And that's why Paul said, upon the first day of the week, bring your tithes and offerings, amen. Why, why, everything's about the first day of the week. So, yeah. anyways, I get excited about a new week, amen. amen. And, uh, uh, amen, forgetting those things which are behind, I look ahead, press forward, amen, to the mark, amen. Thank the Lord for that. Well, let's take our Bibles to Psalm uh, chapter number uh, 33, Psalm 33 will be our opening scripture this morning, and I do appreciate the Lord helping us to get back in the routine here again, Amen. and uh, though things are different, and they will always be different, but uh, we continue to pick up with what we've got and go forward, and thank the Lord for that, Amen. Amen. Psalm 33, the verse number 1 says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous if you're saved by the grace of God, that means that His righteousness has been imputed to your account, right. and therefore you are qualified, yea, even commanded, to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. He didn't say rejoice in the world or rejoice in the devil. He said rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. Why? Why? For praise is comely yes, for the upright. Amen. You're saying you ought to be praising him. He said in verse number two, praise the Lord with heart. Well, a piano is a type of a harp. I don't know if y'all knew that or not, but it is. Uh, it's a type of a harp. It's a stringed instrument. And uh, he said, uh, praise the Lord with the harp. Sing unto him with a psaltery and with an instrument of ten strings. Amen. We got more than ten strings on the harp. Thank the Lord for that. It says the word of the Lord is right. All his works are done in truth. Amen. Uh, and uh, thank God for the truth. The truth of the matter is that God is worthy. And you and I that have been saved by the grace of God mm -hmm. ought to give him the praise that he's worthy Amen. of. Doesn't Amen. matter what's going on in our life. Right. Doesn't matter who's here. Doesn't matter who's not here. Doesn't matter the hurt, the sorrow, the pain, the struggles. All of those things are part of this sin-cursed world. But thanks be unto God, uh, we serve a God who's not a part of this world. He's above Amen. that. Amen. Amen. And he's worthy to be praised this morning. So I pray that that would be your heart, your desire. And uh, this morning we're going to pray and ask the Lord to receive our praise. And what we're going to do is take our songbook and open it up and let her fly. Amen. We sing by letter around here. Just open up your mouth and let her fly. Amen. And let that praise fly under the heavens. Amen. Under the God of heaven that he might be well pleased. Because the Bible says this. God inhabiteth the praise of his people. Do you know what that word inhabiteth means? It means to sit down and stay a while. I mean, really. And when we start praising God, we're inviting God to be in the midst of us and to, to sit with us. I want God to dwell with us. Amen. There may only be a handful here, but I want God to be here. Amen. The Bible said two or three got together my name. There am I in the midst of them. Amen. So let's pray and ask the Lord to help us today and then remain standing. Chris will come and lead us in congregational praise to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Oh, Lord, we've already enjoyed good time around the altar this morning at 930. We've enjoyed some good time in your word. And, Lord, we've already uh, felt your presence throughout the morning. And, God, I'm thankful that you woke us up this morning and gave us breath of life and gave us another day. I reminded my wife this morning as we were in preparation and getting ready for the day, I said, you know, the Lord reminded me again through a passage of scripture I read earlier that he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. I said, he woke us up. You know, we're supposed to be living. And we're living by faith. We're living unto him. And he continues to work in our lives. <clears throat> he didn't have to give us breath. And we, we rejoiced in that this morning, Lord, as we talked uh, that you gave us breath. Every one of us uh, was given another opportunity to live for you. And I pray that we would live and lift up our praise I pray, dear God, that you would show the world that you're alive and well. I pray you'd show Allen, Texas, that the God of heaven uh, is dwelling in the midst of the Harvest Baptist Church. Uh, 
And I pray that that would be evidence to the Lord. Thank you for the grace that you've been manifesting in our lives through this great deep sorrow and hurt and pain and the loss of Don. And God, we are grieving and there will be days ahead where there will be much mourning and grieving. But God, we do sorrow, but not as others which have no hope. And I pray for Barbara again this morning. Touch her, help her. And God, may we all, uh, though the body may be tired, the body may be weak, may we realize that uh, the, 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 the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And may we uh, fight and struggle to pay attention and give our hearts to you and to your word this morning that, God, we would get what we need for our own lives. And I pray you'd bring some folks in, even after the fact. May they come in and sit down at the Lord's table and feast upon the manna that gets broken from uh, heaven above. And Lord, would you uh, bake up a fresh batch of bread uh, and send it down to your people that we may feast uh, upon the bread at the house of God today. Have your will, have your way. Be honored, be glorified, be magnified. Have the preeminence in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Take your Bible. Your Bible. Take your song. That's the next thing. Two good books you need is a Bible, amen, a King James Bible, and a hymnal, amen. Take your Praise hymnal to turn page 167. Page 167.
But notice this now as it goes on in the same verse. It said, when men who hear, the men on earth refuse to pray. And I tell you something this morning. You know why the house of God's in You know why our nation's in ruin? You know why so many people are miserable and destitute? You know why? Because they refuse to pray to the God of men. Because the Bible still says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and what? And pray. Men refuse to pray. They don't pray. They, they play games. They, they just try to run through life, run through the motions. They try to sin their way out of the guilt of, of conviction. They try to stay busy so they don't think about it. They refuse to pray. But not only that, it says, on rocks and hills and mountains call. You know what's happening? People are worshiping the Creator. I'm, there, I'm sorry. They're worshiping the creation more than the Creator. Right. The lake is full today. The mountains are full of people today. Hey, people are out at the ball games. They're out already this morning. God have mercy. I drove by early this morning and there was a soccer game in full bloom. On the Lord's Day, they're worshiping the ball. They're worshiping the ball. They're worshiping the creation, whatever it is. It says they, they don't mind. Hey, listen, they don't mind going to the mountains, to the, to the hills, the rocks. They cry out to them. But right now, when that's going on, this is how they are blaspheming. This is how foolish they are. They are so foolish, they cannot see that even while they are allowed to do that, right now, God's love is still being extended. The house of God is still open. The man of God is still preaching the word of God. And he's crying out, hey, come you sinners far and wide. The word of God says God still loves the world. He still loves them, even though they reject him. And until that day comes, there is still the extension of God's love. Right now it's not too late. Right now they need to turn from the rocks and hills and turn to the God who heals, who is. But it's not happening. But I tell you what's amazing to me. What blows me away when I was not right with God, when I was in darkness, He still loved me. When I wasn't right, when I got saved, when I didn't feel right, He still extended love to me. The people that we say were, they, 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 they mocked God, they ridiculed, they, they, they just live in sin. Right now, God still shows His love because the house is right. You can even understand, the Holy Ghost is still dwelling among us. But upon the day of the rapture, which could be today, He's going to remove the Holy Spirit of God. And anybody that's ever heard about the love of God at that point will never have an opportunity again to be saved. It'll be too late. The ones that will get saved out of that 144,000 are those that have never heard the name of Jesus. They've never heard Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. That day they will be able to believe it. They will believe it. And they'll all die a martyr's death, every one of them. But today is still time for God's love to be met. I think we'll see that verse again. Well, think about it. Why do we keep knocking doors when people keep rejecting? Why do we keep opening the church house when nobody comes? Why do we keep laboring and sacrificing and spending money to keep the lights on in the church and to, to labor to, to do it right and to make sure the church is nice and taken care of? Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because we're still an extension of God's love to a world that does not know God. Until He comes, that is our responsibility. He said, until the end of the world. The same verse again. On the second
this morning talking to the funeral home yesterday they had to come by the house and drop off the, the remaining plants and a few flowers from uh, Don's funeral on Friday and they said to us they had nine funerals yesterday nine people they put in the ground who just in the recent days obviously uh, their soul departed from their body and I wonder how many of them are burning in hell right now I saw a magnitude of people you know it's, it's just contrast we we gathered together on Friday 25 people 25 people to celebrate a life beyond the grave, to celebrate someone who had eternal life, and that should have been the greatest celebration. And then I saw the contrast yesterday. Chris and I went by and took a few pictures of the grave, and it was quite a sad contrast because just over in the distance, there was probably a good 150, yes, maybe 200 people gathered. As, as, I mean, it was unbelievable. And I began to think in my mind, I didn't say much, but I began to think in my mind, I wonder, if they're celebrating the life of someone that is burning in hell for all of eternity. I can't say that that's the case. I'm just saying I wonder. I wonder if they've rejected the love of God and yet people flock by the groves to celebrate something that's not even there. And it just, there's a contrast. You understand that. I look upon the tombstones in the graveyard and I see, uh, oftentimes I can tell, they was obviously a believer. I saw tombstones, Brother James, that had an open Bible and uh, verses of scripture that were there that indicated evidently they knew the Lord. And then I saw others that were a shrine to Buddha or Muhammad, a, a Chinese grave there where there uh, uh, the false gods. And I thought, my, my, and yet there's nothing there, boy. And I'm talking about the love of God is being manifested. You know, a lost person could go to celebrate the life of a lost person while they're burning in hell and be completely ignorant of the love of God. And did you know they're going to walk? They might walk by a tombstone and John three sixteen is etched in the tombstone, and they're now without excuse because no matter if they've ever heard it or not, they just were witness to the manifestation of the love of God through adversity. I'm talking about man, that'll get you to thank Him. You wow. I mean, it just lines up with the message this morning. I love the Lord. I'm thankful for his help. These have been some difficult days for our family, and I am thankful for the grace of God. I'm glad I know the love of God because I'm not depressed this morning. Amen. I may have a discouraged heart at times. I may I, I may have a broken heart, but I am not depressed. Thank God. I don't have a reason. If there ain't a child of God that's got a reason to be depressed. Right. I mean, if everything falls wrong, you're going to take your last breath and go to heaven, friend. That's a, a reason to rejoice. I'm not depressed about it. And uh, there was no reason for a child of God to be depressed. You know why? If a child of God gets depressed because they don't know this book, amen. And uh, thy word is very nigh unto me. I thank God for the love. That's a good song. I'm glad you picked that song. Yeah. I've sung that in a long time. And, uh, boy, I like, that. I, like that. I like them old hymns, amen. But thank God for that. A couple of announcements. Um, don't forget tonight, six o'clock, we'll be back in uh, 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 in the service here tonight. I'm actually um, just out of honor. I, I know it's a little different, but this is what the Lord laid on my heart this week. I, I have, and I'll say more about it tonight. But I have uh, I have uh, had Don's little Bible uh, for a few days, and I've gone through and I've looked at different notes and things, and I'll be honest with you, help my heart. And uh, I, I'm going to return that. Uh, Chris has given that to him. Uh, sometime back and it just comes full circle you know and, and so I'm going to give that back to Chris uh, but I have been uh, I've been hoarding it for a few days and walking through there in the mornings and reading and I found a passage of scripture that I preached uh, this that looks I think the date was 2020 uh, I believe that's right and uh, and uh, Don made quite a few notes of that message and I thought man he must have enjoyed that and the Lord just said, why don't you just preach it again? Amen. And uh, it won't hurt none of us to hear it again. Amen. But I thought, well, that's, why not? You know, uh, he, God wouldn't let me preach it at his, I was going to preach it at his funeral. Uh, and that was my heart's desire, and the Lord wouldn't let me. I believe I minded the Lord. Uh, and uh, there were lost people there, by the way. And uh, there might not have been a lot of people, but there was a lot of people there. And uh, God knows, and there were people that we've been getting reports and watched that on the internet. And so you just don't know how the gospel seed might work. But uh, tonight I'll be preaching that uh, short message uh, just in honor of Don. Amen. The Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. Amen. And um, that'll be how we conclude that part. 
of our grieving, at least publicly. And, of course, we'll be having it on the Internet, so I'll be doing that tonight. But then uh, Thursday night, God willing, we're going to get back into the book of Proverbs. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, see if we can remember where we're at. And, uh, hey, Proverbs has been a good help. Amen. Yes, sir. And uh, this uh, Saturday, God willing, we'll plan to meet here at 9 o'clock. And we'll go uh, get back to our door knocking and uh, keep on trying to win people to Jesus. Amen. I had a man call me Friday night. And he may show up uh, today, may show up tonight, may show up just any time. It's, I believe his name is Grady Moore. He's 86 years old. And uh, he said, uh, he started the conversation, uh, this is Grady Moore. I don't know if you remember me. You came and knocked on my door. When he said that, I knew exactly who he was. And uh, we had. A, he said, you met me when you was out knocking doors. And he's a Baptist preacher. And uh, anyways, and so... Uh, he was. Uh, he called me and talked to me for a good 30, 40 minutes on Friday night in the midst of all that. And I thought, my, my. And uh, he said, I want to come visit the church. And uh, they live over there uh, where we were knocking doors. That was three and a half years ago. And he still remembers me. He said, one of these days, you and I are going to sit and drink coffee. I said, let's do it. And so you just pray for them. And then we had a lady to come visit Thursday night. Uh, and I forgot to make the note on the Facebook page that we would be at the funeral home. And my wife, she called my wife. My wife started giving her the information about the funeral. And she was a little confused. Uh, what's going on? And uh, then my wife realized and She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. And uh, But maybe she'll come tonight. You pray that God, whatever, draw her here the first time, to bring her back. Amen. Yes. And Amen. so we're looking forward to that. And uh, just plugging away. The year is moving on quickly. And uh, it's hard to believe we're fixing to change seasons again. Amen. But thank the Lord for that. I believe my family's going to sing one. And we'll get right into Genesis chapter number 7 this morning.
right song. Bring it about. The Bible says that as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our sins, those of us that are saved. And uh, that's the truth. You know, but uh, you know, the Bible doesn't say that. In fact, if, if you study the Bible, you'll find out God can't forget. He can't forget. He's God. He's perfect. He can't forget. Forgetting is a flaw. And so when it comes to our sins, God doesn't forget our sins. The Bible tells us he chooses to remember them no more. There's a big difference in forgetting and right. choosing to remember them no more. Amen. And uh, so many people beat themselves up because they can't forget things. Listen, the Bible teaches us to forgive, but never do you find anywhere in the Scripture which says you've got to forget. Amen. Now, <coughs> if you dwell on it, you'll get bitter and never be able to forgive. But uh, you may forgive, amen, and uh, choose to not remember, amen. That's what, that, that you make a choice not to dwell on it. That, that's important because there's a lot of things, I'm going to tell you the truth, there's a lot of sins in my life, uh, even since I got saved, that I wish I didn't know. I wish I could forget them. I would give anything to forget them. I put them out of my mind, I don't dwell on them. But see, you know what happens? The devil comes by when you're doing good spiritually, and you're walking with God, and having victory, the devil come by and put that memory in your mind. I believe that. He'll put it right in front of you and say, remember this? And uh, try to make you doubt everything. Amen. And uh, Boy, that song's a blessing. There's coming a day, though. The bottom line is there's coming a day I will never have to remember because I will forget. Amen. God's going to wipe that from my mind. Hey, you know, he's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. And I believe this. I can't I can't be dogmatic, but I believe there's going to come a day of the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know if that's where it's going to happen or not. What do you think is going to cause God to wipe all the tears from our eyes? I believe it's this. I believe it's going to be two things. I believe it's going to be everything that we're going to give account for. All the idle words we ever said. All the things we did or did not do. And then I also think we're going to weep, weep, weep over the people that are going to die and go to hell because we didn't live right in front of them. We didn't show them the true uh, childlike, Christ-like faith. And we didn't tell them. I believe there's going to be some great weeping. Don't think there won't be. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I can watch somebody suffer and they can be moved me to tears now uh, because I have compassion and, and that's just a temporary physical suffering. I promise you to see somebody get thrown off into hell, uh, they look you in the eyeball and say, I love you. Why didn't you ever tell me? You said you were my friend, but you never lived right. You told me one thing and lived another. My soul, you better read your Bible, friend. Thank God. Well, that's good. Y'all been bringing some good convicting songs today. Praise the Lord. And, uh, <clears throat> Don't get nervous. I get encouraged by that stuff. Amen. Amen. You know why? Because I'm in the book. And when you're in the book, it just lines up. Say, oh, thank God for the Bible. Amen. Well, I've given enough commercials today, I guess. Genesis chapter 7. If you'll find your place and uh, stand with me. I'm actually just going to read one verse of Scripture this morning. But we are finally to Genesis 7. And uh, we're doing about a chapter a month. And that's not bad, uh, but when you look at the whole book of Genesis, I think we'll be here a while. Anyway. Genesis chapter 7 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou, now notice this, and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the assembly. Thank you that we're able to be here today and that we're able to assemble in the house of the Lord. Thank you that we have a Bible and God, I don't have to have some kind of opinion or some kind of philosophy or psychology. I just simply need to declare what thus saith the Lord. And the people that are here, they don't need psychology. They don't need somebody to give them an emotional tickling. They don't need somebody to tell them what they want to hear. They need somebody to love them enough to preach what thus saith the Lord. And I pray, dear God, that you would give me the boldness and the authority and the power to do just that. And I need you to speak to hearts, God, as only you can do. Help us to glean from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> we are in a series on Sunday mornings called Going Forward from the Beginning. This is actually message number 18. And so 18 messages we've dealt with, the book of Genesis, going forward from the beginning. I made the statement uh, that I have heard in the past, and I agree with the statement. And the statement is simply this, 
the key to future blessings is to embrace a biblical past. Notice I said a biblical past. Not everything in the past is uh, biblical. Amen. Some of it's traditional. And, uh, you know, I've already broke tradition, Brother James, because we don't take an offering until after I preach on Sunday mornings. And that messes up half the Baptist brethren. Wow, well, you're supposed to do two songs and an offering and another song. And, well, where do you find that in the Bible? Amen. In fact, when we get biblical, we'll put, a, uh, we'll put a treasure chest up here and bore a hole in it. Y'all can learn to start really giving. Amen. I'm telling you, that's how they did it in the Old Testament. But, uh, no, there's things that are good that are traditional, but they're, they're not Bible. But I'm not talking about a traditional past. I'm talking about a biblical past, right. amen, and that's what we're interested in. Thank God for that. Going forward from the beginning, this morning I want to preach this thought this morning as we look at this one verse, and I obviously am going to reference many verses, so please uh, stay limber and uh, be ready if you need to take notes. But the message I would like to preach this morning is this. The beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. The beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. Notice that verse with me again. There's a few things I think we need to note for sure. It's worth highlighting and paying attention to as we go through this. Is number one, excuse me, verse one. Notice it says, and the Lord said. Uh, this is not the opinion of a man. This is not another man looking upon a man and saying he's righteous. Amen. Uh, the Bible says that man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. And we know that if the heart is right, I just believe the Bible teaches, if the heart is right, guess what? The outward will be right. Amen. And so right. we get so many people so confused about Bible preaching because, well, either they've heard somebody uh, that doesn't understand the Scriptures and they neglect to ground things in the Scriptures and they do preach the outward, uh, but they don't give Bible for that or they put the emphasis on the outward and not the inward. Uh, listen, the Bible has much to say about the outward, but it's all because of a work that's done inward. You know what the Bible says? Work out your own salvation. Right. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't mean work to be saved. It means work because you are saved. In other words, what's on the inside needs to be worked out on the outside. Is that right or not? And so we understand that. Well, this morning, notice he said, the Lord said, I'm glad that when we look at a man and we're looking at the beginning of righteous men in a wicked generation, we are looking at a man that God said was righteous, not doesn't matter what the society said. Doesn't matter. You know what? If Noah was alive in this day and hour, all the brethren, every Baptist pastor, all the fundamental brethren uh, uh, that are so high and mighty, and I'm saying uh, all those that are, not every fundamental brethren is high and mighty. You understand what I mean? But those that are, those that are the ones that are pharisaical, they look down at others that aren't like them or others that actually don't fit some kind of cookie cutter mold, but yet they identify with the individual, amen, so liberty according to what the Bible teaches us. They say, they would say Noah is a, he's a heathen. He's not one of us because you know he don't have a big crowd. Uh, he's only got eight people in his church. I, I mean, are you listening to what they say? And I mean, he's nuts. Uh, he's been over there preaching for 120 years. Uh, and nobody's listening. Nobody's changing. Nobody's getting conformed. Nobody's getting saved. What a waste of time. What a waste of energy. That's what the world would say. God said, no, he's righteous. He's righteous. I'm telling you what, I'd much rather have God tell me and tell other men about me that I'm righteous in his sight than to have a bunch of men toot my horn and pat me on the back. Amen. And notice it said, the Lord said unto Noah, come thou. He invited them. I'm thankful for that. Uh, God invited Noah. He said, come thou. Now, we could stop there. If that was all that was said, we could rejoice all night long. Uh, but what a sad statement that would be. Uh, come thou. That would mean, Noah, I'm, I know you got a wife, and I know you got three sons, and I know you got three daughters-in-law, mm -hmm. and they can all go to hell. You just come, because you're walking with me. Now, that could be fine, and God would still be justified if that were the case. You need to understand right. that. But that's not what he did. Notice what he said. He said, come thou and all thy house. Amen. God's interested in saving a household. He's interested in mama and daddy both getting in. Amen. He's interested in the children getting in. He's interested in their spouses getting in. He's interested in their children getting in. You know why? Because the purpose of marriage is to raise a godly seed. Thank God. God invited the whole household in. He said, come thou and all thy house into the ark. Well, here's why. Here's the reason though is what I want to emphasize this morning. He said, for thee. Now, notice he did not say, I saw your wife, 
that she's righteous. Now, I'm not saying she wasn't. You understand that? But, but, but get this now. I saw your wife, and she's righteous. That's not what he said. He said, those three boys of yours, man, they sure are godly. I saw them righteous, so I want them to come too. That's not what he said. And you know those daughters-in-law are devils. No, he didn't say that either. But he said this. He said, thee have I seen righteous. There's a lot of emphasis there on purpose because God is showing mercy to the household of Noah because Noah's righteous. Well, if you know anything about the ways of God, you know that God knew about Noah that Noah would command his house to walk right. Who else did that? Abraham. Remember, Abraham commanded his children to walk in truth. Amen? And that's why God blessed them. I believe the same is probably true of Noah. He said, Thee. Now watch what he says, though. Thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, it might not matter to you, but that those last three words of that verse are the whole entire message of the verse. I've seen thee righteous in this generation. We need to look at that a little bit deeper this morning. Number one, I want to notice the man. Notice the man. He said, thee have I seen righteous. Notice the man. Noah was righteous in wicked generations. We're preaching this morning the beginning of righteous men in a wicked generation. Can I just say that if Noah was in that wicked generation, the only generation that's ever been up to this very moment that God had to destroy the entire humanity and destroy the entire world, that's a pretty wicked generation, friend. And if Noah could be righteous in that generation, what is your excuse? What is my excuse to not be righteous in this generation? You say, it's bad. Yes, it's bad. Bad, but it's not as bad as it's ever been. I'm about sick to death up to here of hearing preachers and people say, oh, it's never been this bad. I say, you're a blessed fool. You don't know your Bible. It's been so bad that God had to destroy everything and he's not done it since because the earth is reserved under judgment by fire. Amen. I'd say if Noah could live righteous in a wicked generation, then you and I have no excuse. Amen. But notice he was righteous. The Bible told us in verse 1. Noah was righteous in wicked generations, number one. Number two, I'm noticing the man. Number two, notice what Noah did. Uh, we, didn't, we, we, we read that a, a few weeks back, but I want to remind you of what he said in chapter 6. Noah, not only was Noah righteous in wicked generations, number two, Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 9, by the way, I want you to understand this. This is what made him righteous. This is where he was righteous. Noah walked with God. The Bible says in Genesis 6, 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Thank God for that testimony. Amen. I told my wife a long time ago, and I, I try to remind her in case she ever forgets. When I die... If the Lord doesn't take me out of here by the rapture, I don't really care about having no big tombstone. I don't care about nothing being on there, no bitch way. I said, all I want to be said, and I hope it would be true, is we don't know this man's name, but all we know is that he walked with God. I want that testimony. You say, that's crazy. You know, listen, there's not a greater testimony that you can give to a man. I told my family that. I said, honestly, can you imagine if some people, I'm not, I'm not talking about my family. I'm talking about people that, that look on from the outside. If they can look at our life and say, I don't know that man, that means he wasn't a self-made man. You know what Jesus did? He made himself of no, are y'all listening this morning? Right. He made himself of what kind of reputation? He made himself of no reputation. You know what that means? He wasn't interested in who he was. He wasn't interested in drawing attention to himself. He was interested in doing what? The will of the Father which was what? To draw sinners unto himself that they might come to the Father. Are y'all listening? I'm telling you, right. it would be the greatest testimony any man, woman, boy, or girl could ever have if all that could be said is they walk with God. I've known some men from a distance and I didn't know much about them. I didn't know their name. I didn't know their pedigree. didn't know their family. But I can tell you, I knew some men at home meeting them. I looked at them and said, I don't know much about that man, but I believe with all my heart that man walks with God. I know some ladies. I know some ladies, Brother James, that I don't know them real well, but I mean, I know of them. I've passed through, and I promise you, I've heard some of them pray. I've watched some of their lives, and you know, I said to my wife over and over, I said, 
I don't know much about that lady right there, but I believe with all my heart she walks with God. I believe that. I want that testimony when I die. Noah walked with God. Amen. I'm telling you that's well, how did he walk with God? He didn't walk with God when it was easy. He didn't do it. Well, hey, listen, he didn't have a preacher standing up and preaching the word of God to him. He didn't have some man of God getting in his face a week after week, a Sunday morning and Sunday night, and midweek in a special meeting. He didn't have all of that. He didn't have a Bible. He simply had the command of God, and by faith he trusted that it was God, and he walked with God. You and I, without excuse, Noah walked with God. Number three, Noah, number one, Noah was righteous in wicked generation. Number two, Noah walked with God. Number three, I'm just noticing the man. Are y'all with me this morning? I know this. Noah found grace. He found grace. Amen. I don't know if he's looking for it or not, but he found it. Amen. You know what I believe? The Bible said Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You ever heard somebody say, I found the Lord? You ever heard somebody say that? Right. I just look at him and smile and say, you didn't find him. You didn't find the Lord. He was looking for you before you ever even thought about him. That's what the Bible says. He came to what? Yeah. Seek and to save that which was lost. lost. If you were lost, he was seeking you already. For you. Hey, man, you know what Jesus said? Except my Father which sent me, draw them, they cannot come. You know what I mean? Even before I ever knew he was looking for me, he was looking for me. Are y'all with me? I don't yeah. care you know a found grace. I, I think God was looking for somebody. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro the earth seeking him to make bless. I, he must have looked over there and said, there's old Noah. He's a walking with me. And Noah said, Boop, I found grace. He walked right into grace. Mm -hmm. Grace was looking for him. I mean, I get excited about that. Noah found grace. You found verse uh, number 8 of chapter 6. It said, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm talking about a man, a man who was the first of righteous men in wicked generations. Noah found grace. Not only that, I see the fourth thing about Noah. I'm just talking about the man for a minute. I found the fourth thing here. These are verses we've already read and studied. Amen. Uh, but I found that Noah, not only, notice what happens when Noah, when Noah found grace, you know what he did? He obeyed. He began to obey the Lord. He obeyed the Lord when he found grace. And I'm going to tell you right now, I should preach about three and a half hours right there all over the world about when you find the grace of God, when God chose grace and saves your blessed, wretched soul, then you ought to learn to obey Him. It shouldn't be hard if God saves you from, a, I'm talking about from a devil's hell and He gives you eternal life. What blessed excuse do you have not to obey right. all of the commandments of the Lord. Jesus said if you love me, then keep my commandments while I call you me Lord. Don't call me master and do not the things that I say. Noah found grace and then Noah obeyed God. Verse number 22 of chapter number 6, the Bible said thus did Noah according now, now, now notice this, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. Noah didn't just pick and choose. He did all. In fact, you go look at verse 5 of our uh, chapter 7. We're in chapter 7. Look at verse 5. It says that Noah did according to, what does it say? And some of the things he liked, Noah did what he liked, and he didn't do what he didn't like. He did what he understood and didn't do what he didn't understand. No, that's not what it said. It said Noah did all. Is that what your Bible says? It says <laughs> Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. I'm telling you, Noah obeyed God. Thank the Lord. In fact, I'll give you another reference. Uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, look at verse 9. Verse 9 said, uh, Then went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female. By the way, it's still the male and female. As God commanded, Noah did all. And verse number 16, uh, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him up. What are you saying? I'm saying Noah obeyed God. Those are good references to his obedience. Genesis chapter 8, verse number 15 and 16. Listen to what it says. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. And they did, because you get to verse 18, it says, And Noah went forth. And his son. Now wait a minute. God said, Noah, go forth. And it says, Thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy son's wife. That's a total command. You go, you take your wife, take your sons, and make sure they take their wives. That's the command. It's a thorough command. And notice what Noah did. In verse 18 of chapter 8, Noah went forth. He took it, he went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his son's wives with him. You know what he did? He obeyed God. God said, do it this way. He did it that way. And then I see one more thing about the man, about Noah. Noah lived by faith. Noah lived by faith. We're talking about how do you have righteous men in wicked generations? Can I tell you how you're going to have to live right. by faith? 
and not by sight. You don't know us all. Noah saw the wickedness that God saw. You know how he did? Because God showed him. God showed him that there was a wicked world before him. And that's why God was about to destroy the entire world. Uh, and God was going to bring judgment upon every creeping thing upon the face of the earth. Except for eight precious souls. Noah and his family, by the way. If you want to study numbers in the Bible. Or the first fruits and the first mentions. Whatever you want to study. The number eight. Does anybody know what the number eight means in the King James Bible? Number eight is new beginnings. Number eight is new beginnings. You know what that means? God is going to start over with eight. Amen. That's where the first mentions are. Eight is new beginnings. What's number seven? Number seven is completion. Amen. Number five is grace. I could go on and on. Uh, uh, right. Six is the number of man. But no, no, no doubt about that. Uh, Noah lived by faith. Uh, chapter uh, seven. I'm sorry. Chapter eleven of Hebrews. You know what Hebrews chapter eleven is called? The Hall of Faith. Noah made it in the New Testament. Can you believe that? A man that lived by faith. Why did Noah make it to the New Testament? Because he was a man that was righteous in a wicked generation. And notice what it says in Hebrews 11, 7. By faith, Noah. Mm. He lived by faith. Now notice this. By faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Had Noah ever seen rain? No. no. How did he know rain was coming? Because he believed God. Had he ever seen rain? He didn't understand rain. They probably never saw a cloud. I mean, if you go study that, now you've got to study your Bible, friend. But Noah never seen a cloud, as far as I know. And, uh, and yet, God said it's going to rain. What's rain? What's rain? Uh, well, this is, I mean, how, how did he, hey, so you're going to build a boat. What's a boat for? I mean, I'm in the desert. What's a boat for? It's going to rain. Okay. Uh, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And so it says, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet. That's faith, by the way. I moved with fear. You know what he did? He was a fearful man. He trembled at the fact that he's dealing with a thrice holy God. He's dealing with a God that is righteous in his anger and a God that will not tolerate sin. And Noah knew that. And don't you think for a minute that he wasn't trembling the whole time. Uh, oh, God, please, uh, have mercy on I, I don't know how the prayer life would have been, but I believe with this. Uh, you know what keeps me trembling, Brother James? Uh, every time I come down to the house of God, knowing that God told me to come here, and I keep crying out against sin and crying out to people. People to turn to the Savior and they won't listen and they won't take heed. It makes my heart to tremble because I fear the judgment and the wrath upon this city. I think, oh God, if these people don't wake up, God's going to turn them over to a reprobate mind. They'll never be able to be saved because they will not listen. I think of people that have sat in this church some of them many, many, many times. They've heard the word of God time after time after time. And they've turned away. You know what's dangerous? They've probably been given over to a reprobate mind. Cannot be saved. Amen. There's a time that God turns them over because they've said no for the last time. I fear. That makes me fear and tremble. My, my, my. He said he, said he moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which, by the way, by obeying God and his salvation plan, his very salvation condemned the world. And he became heir of the righteousness which is by what? Faith. Faith. See, he didn't. He, there's some perverts out there. When I say that, they pervert the word of God. There's some heretics. There's some people that teach some damnable heresy. You know what they try to say? I've heard it. You say, this is crazy. I know there's some crazy lunatics out there. I've heard preachers preach that Noah, uh, these Calvinists and these that believe that you can work your way to heaven, they'll preach that Noah, the reason he got saved because he built an ark. That ain't what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible says that's not what made him righteous. It was the righteousness of faith. Amen. He believed in God. And he believed in the deliverance of God by faith. Amen. I'm talking about Noah lived by faith. So number one, we notice the man. Number two, I want you to notice something else. We're talking about the beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. I noticed the man Noah. But number two, I want you to notice the generation he was in. Notice the generation. Number one, According to the Bible, we've already read this, you know, several weeks ago, but I'm going to re reference some of these verses again because we're trying to get the whole picture here. The generation that Noah lived in, number one, it was a wicked generation. I told you the title of the message this morning is the beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. How do you know that generation was wicked? Because the Bible tells me so. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5, listen to what the Bible says. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. You know what that tells me? It's a wicked generation. The wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I'm talking about a wicked generation. Noah's generation was a wicked generation. 
Notice, notice something else about the generation number two. Not only was it a wicked generation number two, it was a violent. It was a violent generation. I've heard people say in the last three or four years, oh, we've never seen so much violence. I said, you don't know your Bible. This violence that we see is bad. Somebody say amen right there. Yeah. The violence yeah. that we see that's being inflicted upon uh, people, turning against people because of the color of their skin or because of what they believe politically or what they believe biblically. I'm telling you, it's violent. It's awful. It's wicked. I, I, I've witnessed violence just in the last few weeks, even uh, among people that you would never expect it for. But you know, that violence doesn't even compare. As wicked as you turn around, violence on every hand. Is that not right? I don't have to turn on the, I don't even have a TV, but I can turn on my, my, my news feed or something on YouTube or, or whatever. I have some sources I look at. I promise you, not a hardly a day go by where you don't see some violence being manifested. I, I mean, yesterday, I I heard yesterday, uh, this morning, I was reading through something, and I heard uh, in Southern California, I don't remember the name of the town, a town where it really is not known for violence. That's how they labeled the, the article, a town that rarely ever sees violence. Uh, now, when you talk about California, it's hard to even put those two things in the same sentence, a town that never sees violence. But uh, what it ended up happening was, uh, I think about three teenagers, I believe that's right, three teenagers were murdered, they were ambushed in a town, you know why? Because of violence. Now, I'm talking about violence, friend, every day, yeah. every day. But you think about all that, and that, that generation was a violent generation. Right. We don't even know the how. Here's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. It was a violent generation. Notice the generation was wicked. It was violent. Number three, let me tell you something else about that generation, Noah's generation. It was a corrupt generation. It was corrupt. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 12 says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. It was corrupt. Well, there's a lot of corruption today. My soul, especially in politics. A lot of corruption. Can I say something else? There's a lot of corruption in churches. There's a lot of corruption in the pulpit. And that, no wonder there's corruption in the pew because the men in the pulpit in many places don't have enough dignity, enough integrity yes. to stand on what's right even if everybody leaves. Yes. There's a lot of corruption taking place. I hear stories every day. Recently, I've heard a whole lot of more corruption. And it doesn't shock me. It doesn't surprise me. It breaks me. But I'm like, you don't understand. There's a lot of corruption. A lot of corruption, but not like this. That generation was corrupt. The Bible says, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, all flesh, not just some, not just the politics, not just the churches, not just all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That's what the Bible says. Man, that's pretty dogmatic, isn't it? There's no exception. There's only eight people that hadn't corrupted themselves with violence and with corruption. That was Noah and his family. Now, you think about something. That'd be kind of like, there's, there's eight of us in here this morning. That'd be like, we're the only people that's doing right. Now, that's not the case. But can you imagine? If we were the only ones going to get to go and God's going to destroy the entire world, buddy, put that in perspective. Now, that's a corrupt world. Corrupt. Not only that, you see, it was a wicked generation. It was a violent generation. It was corrupt, but I see something else about the generation. It was a generation that was marked for the judgment of God. We talked about the judgment of God two Sundays ago, or three Sundays ago now. Right. And we dealt with that. This was a generation that was marked for the judgment of God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7 says this. And the Lord said, notice this, I will destroy. Remember the beginning of the judgment of destruction? We preached that just a few weeks ago. The beginning of the judgment of destruction. God said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Boy, I'll tell you a good question by way of going through this text and review, and I want to ask you a question. Have you ever looked into your life? Or maybe you asked the Lord, Lord, search my heart in this way. Have I brought regret to you? Do you regret that you made me? Do you regret that you saved me? Because I bring such shame to you. You say, what in the world? I'm telling you, you better think about that. They said, repent of the Lord that he made. Now, wait a minute. The creator God, who gave his own breath, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Come on now. He says, it repenteth me that I made man. I just wonder 
It's, it's worthy of consideration. Does your life bring sorrow to God because you won't reflect who He is in your life? My soul. There's a generation marked for the judgment of God in chapter 6, verse 7. Not only that, verse number 13 of chapter 6, the Bible says, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. There's that violence again, through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. He's not only going to destroy those that are upon the earth, he's going to destroy the earth, and he did. We saw some of that just a few weeks ago. God has seen that this place, this generation, Noah's generation, was a wicked generation, and it was a generation that was marked for the judgment of God. Now, let me just say this about our generation as we get ready to look. We're trying to compare. We see the man. We see the beginning of righteous men. Noah was the righteous man. And what generation was he in? He was in a wicked generation. We see the beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. I believe that's the case. That's our story. That's our account. These things were written for our learning and our admonition. We need to definitely evaluate our generation. If we're going to find righteous people in a wicked, wicked uh, generation, we better understand the generation we live. We better understand the man that was in that generation. What made him righteous? Because what made Noah righteous in his wicked generation is the very same thing and the only thing that God's going to look in us and find righteousness in us even in the midst of a wicked generation. Notice our generation. Our generation. The, the generation we live in, you and I. It is a generation like unto Noah's. It is. It is a generation like unto Noah's. Why is it not a generation of violence? Absolutely. Is it growing every day? Absolutely. Is there great wickedness in this generation? Man, I'm watching car after car after car driving by. You know what that is? A signification of the wickedness of the generation we live in. They don't care about God. They don't care about the things of God. It's a wicked generation. It's, it's a generation that says, I'm more important than anybody the God of self is more important than the God of heaven. Somebody say amen right there. They love men shall be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. You know, if it's not comfortable for me, I'm not doing it. If it's not convenient for me, I'm not doing it. I refuse to read my Bible because I'm too stinking. Well, we won't say this, but this is the truth. I'm too stinking sorry and lazy to get out of my comfort zone, get out of my bed, wake my flesh up from the sleep that I desire and crave because my flesh is number one. And I refuse to read the word of God because I just don't care. That's the generation we're living in. I refuse to go to the house of God and let some man, some man, some fleshly sinful man tell me how to live my life even though God ordained that. That's the generation we're living in. You know why churches struggle financially? Because God's people have not put God first. Mm -hmm. You know why churches, that's the only reason churches struggle financially. Because if all of God's people would do what they're supposed to do and not be selfish, you know what would happen? Oh, well, my soul, the missions around the world would be uh, 10,000 times manifold. And, and the work that the church could actually do and the things we could do for God across the land. I'm talking about across the land. You know what's sad? I know churches today that got a mil one mil at least, at least, I've, I've seen the report, at least $1 million in their missions fund. Can I just say something you might not like? That's wicked as hell. The straight out of pits of hell. It's wicked. Wicked. You know why? Because if the Lord comes back today and they stand before God, they left a million dollars sitting in the bank that could have put people where lost souls are and reached them for the gospel, which is, mm, by the way, the reason he blessed them. But they're too busy caring about self instead of souls. Are, are y'all listening to me? Right. I believe in all you say what you want to do. I believe in all God's not happy with that. Yeah. I know churches that have over a million dollars in the general fund. And yet their property's paid for. Their buildings are paid for. You know what they have? They have no need. And they got all this money. Uh, why don't they use that for God? Why don't they go buy some land and some buildings and places, I don't know, like Allen, Texas and mm -hmm. other places and start a church? I know that's too deep, isn't it? But I'm telling you, we live in a wicked generation. Notice some things about our generation is like unto Noah's. The Bible says in Matthew, Jesus speaking here in chapter 24, verse 37 through 39, the Bible says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Can I just say this? I believe we're very close to the return of the Lord. Yeah. I'm looking for Him. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really, I'm not looking for a sign. I'm listening for a sound. 
Because the signs are all fulfilled. There's not a single prophecy in that Bible that has to be fulfilled for Jesus to come back. Do you understand how significant that right. is? We're not waiting on anything to take place. We're just waiting on the trumpet to sound. And we're, we're out of here, buddy. You know what? If we're seeing what we can see, if you're looking through the eyes of the Lord and you're looking through spiritual eyes and you see the wickedness of our land and you see the violence and the corruption and all that's there, if you are absolutely not ignorant spiritually, you cannot help but say, it's, awful. it's starting to look an awful like, like it did in Noah's day, right? Well, can I say this? If we can see what we can see, Right now, and we can see, man, there's a lot of parallels between. Now, we're not there, but there's an awful lot of parallels between our day and Noah's day. Then I wonder how close we truly are to the coming of the Lord because he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. He said, for as did, listen to this now, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Everybody's just carrying on with life. They're just having a good time. The barbecue's being full. I mean, they're fellowshipping. They're having a good time. They're at the parties. They're at the ball game. They're getting, their people just keep on getting married. They just keep on living their life. In other words, they're giving no thought to the fact that time is about to expire. They're just carrying on. These people were carrying on for 120 years while Noah was preaching righteousness to them that you need to repent. God's judgment is sure to fall upon the entire humanity. 120 years! Wasn't once or twice a week either. Can I just tell you that? It was every single day. I promise you it was every single day building that ark. God gave him the details. He gave him the blueprint. He said, you build and you preach. You build and you preach. And I believe the Bible mm -hmm. said no, it was a preacher of righteousness. Is that what it said? I mean, every day. What was it like? I don't know. But he was out there with a hammer uh, in one hand and the pitch in another hand and, uh, and preaching the word of God. <laughs> they just kept on living their lives. Ah, oh, that old man's off his nut. He's, he's crazy. You know what? He's not the first one to ever hear that. There's a lot of people that think Brother Lee's crazy. And it's not because of the way I act. I mean, everybody's got a little bit of that in them. You know what it is, son? It's because of where I stand on the Word of God. Oh, you're a fanatical. Okay, so I'm fanatical. I believe that book, every word, but I take it literal. You know what I am? Right. I'm a literal right. biblicist. I believe in the Word of God. We take it literally. Somebody say amen. And so people will say, oh, you're nuts. You just, I've had people tell my wife, all you do is wear dresses and skirts and you think you're better than everybody. Have you ever told anybody you're better than them? That's what, that's conviction, by the way. Oh, you think you're, I had an uncle one time because I wouldn't go drink beer with him no more. When I got things right with God, he said, oh, you think you're better than me? I said, not at all. Not at all. That's the generation. Oh, that old man's crazy. He said, he, he said as it was in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And listen to this now. And they they knew not. Even when Noah went inside the ark, the Lord brought them in and shut them in. Those people were so engrossed in their sin and their wickedness, they still didn't get it. Now you think about that. Where'd Noah go? Oh, I don't know. At least he shut up. Don't have to hear him preach. No, I'm glad God shut him up. And don't you know there was probably some? I'm speculating here. Y'all with me? Stay, stay awake. I know it's we're tired, but listen, we got to keep on moving with life. Don't you know, pride, brother James, there was some that said, oh, he just needed to shut up, so God shut him up. We don't have to, God, you see, he wasn't right with God. He was over here telling us all this judgment's coming, and God just took him out and said, thank God, we don't have to listen to that preacher no more. Are you listening? Said so they didn't even know. I mean, I'm talking about up to the very moment, friend. And I'll be honest with you, if I'd been hearing a preacher, and I was even halfway convicted that what he was preaching was true, and all of a sudden he shut up, I started getting real nervous, friend. Like, what happened? I mean, it's kind of quiet. That, that makes me nervous. Hey, man, if I go around and around to God and all of a sudden he quits preaching, I, sometimes it's not what I hear that, that bothers me as much as what I don't hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says that they knew not until the flood came. It wasn't until the flood came that they woke up. I don't know how it was, Brother James, but in my mind, and that, I'm talking about that generation, how our generation is like them, that all of a sudden they're standing out there crying out, mocking, and all of a sudden Noah's gone, he disappears, he, he's quiet. And they thought, maybe maybe somebody thought this. I'm sure somebody did. <sighs> Boy, I'm so glad. Uh, maybe they sat down with their family at a new wedding beach and said, Troy, I'm glad that preacher shut up. Because that's fixing to kill him. I mean, I, I mean, I'm just about at it with it. I'm sick and tired of hearing him. Every time I go get drunk, every time I'm fornicating, every time I'm having sodomy, are you listening to the generation? You better know the generation. Every time all that's happening, he said, I'm about ready to kill that preacher, but God took him out so I don't have to. And they sit down, and maybe they sit down for the first time, and they, they thought, oh. hey, y'all listen. 
I don't hear no preacher. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Maybe they took a walk thinking everything's fine. And they went walking. I'm just in my, I know I'm weird. I get myself in the pictures though. And I imagine maybe Christopher, maybe they was walking and they was thinking, man, I, man, I've it's 120 years. I mean, I was about to kill that guy. I know, I'm thankful it's, it's over. Aren't you glad we can enjoy our worldly music and our, our worldly dress and our sinful, lustful, sexual activity? Thank God we don't have to deal with that preacher no more. I don't know how that might have been. All of a sudden they're walking along thinking that. And, and, and something happens. Hey man, what are you spending it before? I didn't spit at you. Well, I don't know where that was. What in the world? Hey man, what are you spending it? I didn't spit at you. Maybe they began to talk. Y'all okay? Mm -hmm. And they began to talk. Man, I don't know what in the world. What in the world? And maybe the drop started coming. Hey, what's going on here? Hey, what's going on? All of a sudden, the rain began to fall. They said, then they knew. I don't know what it was like, but I kind of got a feeling about that. That first raindrop might have brought Holy Ghost conviction and they realized, oh God, the man of God was right. We're about to die. Mm -hmm. What a sad statement. Maybe, maybe they stopped what they were doing and they ran to the ice. Hey, no, we were just kidding, man. We are just kidding, man. Let us in. Starting to rain out here. It says, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Mm. I imagine from the first raindrops till the water was up to where they could barely even talk. They were still crying out for mercy, crying for repentance. We believe you. We believe you, Noah. We know that thou art a man of God. We know that thou art a righteous man. Oh, Noah, we're sorry. Oh, forgive us, oh God, forgive us. It is getting closer. And the Bible says they knew not till the flood came and took them. Maybe when they lost their footing, they started floating in the water trying to drown. They, start, they realized it's over. I don't know. He said they knew not till the flood came and took them all away. And this is what Jesus said. This is what I'm talking about. Our generation is like unto that generation because here's what Jesus said when he finished that. He said, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Mm. You let that sink in for a minute. Now God been preaching for a couple thousand years. The Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Since Calvary. Since the New Testament church was in, incepted <coughs> when Jesus started it. All the way till 2023. Men of God throughout the ages have cried out. Men of God have cried out. And they you know what they <coughs> cried out? It started with John the Baptist. Repent. For the coming of the Lord draws nigh. Repent, the Lord is coming. Make his way straight. Clear his path. You better get ready. Jesus, that's what he preached. He preached repentance. And all down through the time that we've been in this church age, men of God have been preaching. Repent, repent, get right with God. You better get right with God. You're going to meet him one day. You know what the man of God, why he preaches the whole council? It's not to make your life miserable, but it's to get you prepared for the coming of the Lord. To get you ready to meet God upon judgment. I don't know. that He said it's going to be like this. It's going to be like this. We're going to continue until Jesus comes. I'm going to continue knocking doors. I'm going to continue handing out gospel tracts. I'm going to continue trying to live a life that is holy and pleasing to the Lord. So I'm going to continue to walk with God in my marriage and in my family and in the things that I do. It's not just on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and Thursday right. nights. It's every single day that my feet hit the ground. God has given me a purpose, and that purpose is to tell everybody everywhere I can about the coming of the Lord. And the day is going to come, Jesus said, we're going to keep doing that. We're going to keep warning of the judgment of God. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all of that, the trumpet's going to sound, and a whole bunch of graveyards are going to get busted up, and a whole bunch of people are going to disappear. Right. Now, let me tell you where we're at. We got, a, we got people in the Pentagon that are so stupid. They're not really stupid. They're stupid to us. But they're not really stupid because, see, we know that, uh, that there is a king in this world. And there's a kingdom of the world, the prince of the power of the air. And he's done set things in place. You know what they're, you know what they're, you know what they're studying in the Pentagon right now? Aliens and UFOs. You see, that's the dumbest. You know what? 50 years ago, they had laughed them to scorn because yep. people had common sense and they understood their Bible. Now, I'm talking 50 years right. ago. Right. Now, you know what they're doing? Yeah, that's right. That's what's going on. They're buying into the baloney. Do you know why? 
because they believe they're deceived and they believe a lie. And that's the beginning of that. And so what's happening is, Brother Jane, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm sure that I'm standing here that this is right. Because the Bible gives us so much indication. I believe what God's doing is allowing the devil to set his stage for his kingdom and his final destination. And all of a sudden, people are believing, oh yeah, there's aliens, there's UFOs. I hear more talk about that. Among God's people, they're so ignorant. And you know why that's all set up right now, son? Because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be oh, in the coming of the Son of Man. He said, here's the way it's going to be. He said, Jesus is going to blow the horn. The horn's going to blow. He's going to rapture us out of here. And the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be. Is that what the book says? Right. What, what are you going to, how are you going to explain to a whole bunch of people standing around living and carrying on with their life? Where did all these people go? Oh, it was a, it was a UFO. Yes, yeah, unidentified because you don't know him yet. And he came and blew us out of here. That's exactly right. I say UFO when Jesus comes in the clouds and takes all of us out of here. Do you know something? I believe this. I, I, I don't know that I can be dogmatic, but I think I can. But I believe this. When the Lord comes, it says in the twinkling of an eye. How fast is that? That's faster than a blink. Everybody blink. It's faster than that. Do you think somebody's going to have time to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and know that that's what took them out? Ain't no way. It's going to be like a flash of light. So there's not going to be somebody say, well, I saw Jesus. Go, no, no, no. They're still going to be standing around, carrying on, living life. And what happened to so Man, that's crazy. They just zapped them out of their clothes. Shoes and everything. Right on around. Shoes, socks, underwear, pants, belt. I mean, everything. Just go. Somebody's going to be driving a car. Can you imagine the chaos upon the light? Are you, are you, can you imagine the chaos? Somebody's got some explaining to do. That's what Lucy, Lucy and Desi would say. Lucy and Desi would come in. Now, you got some explaining to do. Well, somebody's going to have some explaining to do. Where'd everybody go? Mm -hmm. Well, they got a plan. Mm -hmm. The devil has a plan, doesn't he? He said, oh, I've already got that figured out. It's going to be a UFO. They can't identify what just flew out of here. Mm. You say, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. You better listen. I'm telling you, that's, where we, that's how close we are to the rapture. It's already in. Do you understand our government's dealing with that right now? Yeah. They're pouring billions of dollars into proving UFOs exist. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's how close we are to the rapture. I, I'm telling you, you better, you better wake up and smell the coffee for him. He said, that's how it's going to be. They didn't know till the flood came and took them away. Most people won't know that it's too late. In fact, they're not even going to know once we're raptured out of here because they've already got a cover up so that the Antichrist can come home for three and a half years of peace and draw everybody to him. He's obviously going to have something to do with it. Yes, it was a UFO. and this. Um, there's got to be something to that. <coughs> And they're not going to know until they try to get saved and they believe a lie that they have been saved. That's what Jesus said. They're going to be strong. He, who's going to send them that delusion? It ain't the devil that's going to deceive them. Right. It's God himself is going to dilute their mind. They're going to believe a lie. They're going to think they're okay. And so, why? Right, that's going to have to settle them down. There's going to be three and a half years of peace. You understand that? Well, you can't have three and a half years of peace in the midst of chaos. There's got to be some settling down. How's that? They're going to be delusional. Right. I'm just talking about it's a gen our generation is like that. Number one, it's a generation not going to know us. I got to hurry. Number two, it's a generation of teachers instead of preachers. That's our generation. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the time will come. I just want to say the time has come. Yep. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. I mean, they don't enjoy it. They don't endure it. They can't even stay with it. They can't pay attention. They can't listen. They can't take heed to sound doctrine. But after the, listen to what he said, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. That's why you have all the ecumenical churches thriving today. You know why? Because mm -hmm. what people want to hear, they feel good. Oh, I right. go over there and I don't feel bad. I go to Harvest Baptist Church and Brother Lee makes me feel bad. I don't like that kind of preaching. He's so narrow. He's so narrow-minded. He's against everything. I mean, I don't like... I go over here to Joe Blow or Joe Osteen or somebody else and I just feel so good. I just feel so warm and fuzzy. Hey, they have come to the place they will not endure sound doctrine, which has happens to say, thus saith the Lord, you better repent. The judgment of God is sure to fall. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear everything is fine. Mercy. After their own lust shall they heap to themselves. In other words, I want as many as I can. That's what it means to heap to yourself. I like this one. You, you ever talk to me like that? Oh, well, on this day, I like to listen to Joe Blow, Joel Osteen, and over here, I like Joyce Myers, and over here, I like Queflo Dollar, God have mercy. They heap to themselves 
right. teacher having itching ears. You know what that means? The people came into their sound doctrine, and so they get all of these teachers, and they just basically say, tell me what I want to hear. Scratch me right. where I itch. The people have an itching ear. You know why they don't stay in the house of God? They can't endure sound doctrine. You know why? Because they're so full of lust. They just want somebody to tell them what they want to hear. They want somebody to say, it's okay that you're in sin. It's no big deal. Everybody does. It's okay that you're a sodomite. You can't help it. You was born in that body. That's the life straight out of pits of hell. It's okay, Cassidy, if you disobey your mom and daddy. Every little kid does. It's okay. You're just a little kid. No, she needs a fire beat out of her if that happens. With the rod of correction. Amen. But you know what? That's what they're saying. Oh, it's okay. Listen, you have problems with your wife? Just take you a couple of volumes and just go on about your life. Everything will be just fine. She's born that way. She can't help it. She's rebellious. Yeah, because she don't submit to authority. Well, I don't, I don't want to submit to him. He's a devil. Well, he might be, but Sarah obeyed Abraham to the point she called him Lord. And it goes back and forth. You, you, you think this? Don't look at me that way. That's the garbage that's being crammed down people's throat today. These children can't help it. Keep to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's the day we're living in, a day of teachers instead of preachers. You know what happens when you do that? And it says they shall turn away their ears. Their ears shall be turned away from the what? From the truth. And shall be turned unto fables. Fables? Yeah. You, you, you know what? You don't feel like a little girl. You was born in a boy's body. That's a fable. You know what? Marriage is really old-fashioned. You can live together and shack it up and try it out. And if it don't work, just go ahead and find you somebody else. Hey, why buy the cow when the milk is free? Remember when I preached? I don't know if y'all were around. I preached a message one time at a youth camp. Uh, why buy the cow when the milk is free? Oh, yeah. You talk about laying a rubber wood. They looked at me like I don't have them a bag of rattlesnakes. I said, don't look at me that way. That's what we're living. Why buy the cow when the milk is free? Why join the church when I can just get in all the blessings and not have no accountability, no authority? I deal with that in our home church when I go home sometimes. We got a generation that doesn't want authority in their life. It's a generation of teachers instead of preachers. Not only is it like the Noah's, it's a generation of teachers instead of preachers. Number three, it's a generation of perilous times. Mm. I'm just talking about hey, the beginning of righteous men and wicked generations. We need to understand our generation. It's wicked. It's a generation of perilous times. You know what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, do you know what perilous times look like? Sometimes we need to be reminded. Let me give you a list of perilous times that he talked about. These perilous times are described or categorized by certain prevailing sins and lifestyles. They are mentioned to us by specific names. And the reason God gave us the names of these perilous times, these sins, is because they need to be called out by a name. If I go to any meeting anywhere and I just say sin generically, most of the time they'll shout it out. But if I start telling you what the Bible calls sin and start naming sin, people get real uncomfortable and uneasy. Mm -hmm. They need to be denounced. Here's the perilous times he gives us in the book of 2 Timothy in chapter number 3, verses 2 through 5. Here's what he said. Here's the perilous times. Now, think about our, our generation it's a generation of perilous times. Tell me this doesn't fit. He said in verse number 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Uh, you ever heard of a selfie? Don't get mad at me, but where do you think that garbage came from? That's the devil putting a seed in people's mind. Take a picture of self. Well, you could get pretty extreme, and I'm not that far, because I really studied it out too much. But when you start talking about graven images, they would, them old timers thought any kind of picture at all was a graven image. I don't know how much of that. We'll stand before God one day and find out. I don't know. I know one thing. You're not supposed to depict anything of heaven. I mean, that's why we don't have a picture of the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Why? Because you're not supposed to depict the Lord. You're not supposed. I know that for a fact. But what's a graven image that, that has to do with? Anyways, he said they'll be lovers of their own selves. I want everybody to see me. See what I did. Look at me. I know. The only reason we take listen. We we, we can take. A, we don't call it a selfie. We call it a hussy. That's what I was told. When, when we get the whole family in a picture in a group, because we don't have the photographer all the time with us, so sometimes we got to do that. I understand that for memory's sake and all that. But taking selfies, that, did God help? Don't look at me that way. We got a generation that's consumed with self. Every day they put, look what I did. Look where I'm at. I'm over here eating this, right? Who gives a blessed rib? Lovers of self. Not only that, notice this. It says they will be covetous. Everybody wants what everybody else has got. They want something that they don't have. Oh, I wish I had that car. Oh, I wish I had that house. I wish I had their money. I wish I had that wife. 
I wish I had that husband. I wish I had those children. I wish I had those parents. Are y'all listening? Covetous. That's the generation we're living in. Boasters. Oh, I know everything. Yeah, I'm pretty good. Now, i got to be careful. I cut up sometimes with people, and I do, and I don't mean to. I really don't. I don't think I'm good at anything. But I do cut up when it comes to cooking. This is one of my best. But I try to be careful because it can become boasting if you're not careful. Oh, I'm the best cook there is. No, I'll let other people. Hey, the Bible says every man will declare his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Let other people praise thee. Let another praise thee and not thine own lips. So what the Bible says. But what you got a generation says, yeah, I'm number one, baby. No, you're not. Boasters. No, well, I can do this. I'm stronger than you. I can do this. I'm faster than you. I, I'm fatter than you. I don't know why you're boasting that. I can eat more biscuits than you. I mean, who gives a real? Boasters. That's what he said. Perilous times. Boasters. Proud. Good night. Do we live in a generation of proud people? So full of pride. How do you know they're proud? They can't even humble themselves and say they're, they, they can't truly repent. You know, we, I, I preached a message back in uh, Georgia when we were there. Maybe it was October. And I preached on the, the, the tale of two men of God, uh, one that the, 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 those two and the people they serve, those that run to the man of God, those that run from the man of God. Do you remember that message? And I preached about this. The difference is in genuine repentance and pride is pride sorry they got caught. Pride is sorry for the consequences that came as a result of their sins and their choices. And repentance is, I'm not generically sorry. I would name my sin and say, this is what I've done wrong, and I am sorry. That's true repentance. Right. Genuine repentance doesn't exist. In other words, that's like somebody, y'all know, y'all okay? It's like somebody that comes out for if, if I'm lost, save me. You'll never be saved if you're if I'm lost. Right. You've got to agree with God. God already said you're lost. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God, if I've ever done anything, I'm sorry. Would God accept let me ask you something, would God accept that? Yes. He won't accept that, will he? But yet we, we, we try to treat people in the house of God like that's how you're supposed to treat them. I got people that tell me, well, you know, they said they were sorry. So you ought to be, you know what? Zion and Bridget said they were sorry. They're sorry they got caught. They're sorry they got in a mess because of their sin. But are they right with God? <coughs> Did they repent? There's people, I'm telling you right now, if they walked in the back door right now, Brother James, they've done this church wrong and they have been in sin when they left. And I'm going to stop there at the back door and say, if you want to come here, you're going to stand before this congregation and humble yourself and repent. That's biblical. And if you will do that, if you're willing to be that humble and repent, we'll receive you in the better fellowship than what you left. That's what the Bible says. Right. Is that right or wrong? Do you understand? We're living in a proud generation. I'm talking about our generation. I got to hurry. Man, there's a lot of preaching here. It says they were blasphemers. They say God said when God hath not said. Well, I just don't think God wants us to be this way. Hold on. Do you know your Bible? Well, God's a God of peace. You ever heard somebody say that? Well, God, God wants everybody to be in peace. Hold on a second. You know what Jesus said when he sent the disciples out? He said, think not that I came to send peace. I came not to send peace, but to send a sword. Did you know that's what the King James Bible says? When Jesus sent his first disciples out to minister to lost heathen, he said, I didn't come to send peace. I came to send a sword. You know what a sword does? It divides. He said, in fact, he gets real specific. He said, brother against brother, sister against sister, parents against their children, in-laws against their... Uh, that, right. That's what the Bible truth divides. Do you know what the basis is? It's not personality. It's not what we like or dislike. The people that I don't fellowship with, the reason for it is because the truth is a sword and it divides. I can't. Can't compromise. I don't go run around with my family that goes drinking and partying and honky tonking. I love them, but the sword divides. This generation doesn't understand that. They're blasphemous. It says they're disobedient to parents. By the way, you know why they're disobedient to parents? Because the parents never held them accountable. Hey Amen. I believe in the stars. I'm patriotic, son. I believe in the stars right. and stripes. I put on the stripes and they see the stars. Somebody say amen right there. Hey Amen. Hey, disobedient. Are, are you kidding me? Have you been out in public lately? Johnny throws a little temper tantrum. Nah, 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 nah. Mama says, Mama says, do something. No. Well, I tell you what, you, you, I'm going to give you one time in your life to say no, and you'll learn the same time never do that again the rest of your days. They're disobedient to parents. Hey, unthankful. I've never, I'll tell you something about Don, my father in law. There's a lot of things, amen, about him. Quiet man, never showed much emotion. I'm talking about that was just him. But I'll tell you one thing about him that I'll never forget. I, I mean, I've had some devils that were thankful. But nobody in my life, I don't think, has ever been more thankful, or at least expressed thankfulness than Don. 
I mean, there wasn't one time, Brother James, not one time he had to come to my house to eat a meal. Then he, right before he walked out the door, he said, thank you. Thank you. You know what his, one of his last words before he ever went to the hospital to me was right before we left Saturday night? He said, thank you. We showed him where they got, we got, Mark, we got Mimi settled in, got everything moved, showed him the picture. What did he say, son? Right before we left, he told all them he loved them. But before, before I left, he looked right at me and said, we live in a generation, you can bend over backwards for them, you can feed them, and that they start thinking they deserve it. Yeah. You owe me. I don't owe you a blessed thing. I don't owe you a blessed thing. Well, they say, you know how you can tell them they're unthankful? When you, out of the kindness of your heart, do what you do because you love people, and they just look at you, and they don't ever say thank you, that's the generation we're living in. Now, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I don't do what I do to hear thank you. You understand what I'm saying? I don't need that. But I'm telling you something. You need to practice thankfulness. Everybody does. I, you ask my wife, I got a lot of flaws. I'm not lifting me, but I'm supposed to be an example to the flock. I got a lot of flaws. You understand that? I'm a sinner just like you are. But I tell you one thing I don't flaw in, and this is an area God's helped me with, and it's by God's grace. I promise you, there ain't a thing that ever comes through my hands that I don't take the time right then and there. My wife will get aggravated with me sometimes because I stop. I mean, because I mean, it might be, you can do that later, you know. And I understand, but I'm just that way. I'm like, baby, if I do, what have I told you? Time, time. If I do that later, I'll forget. It'll never happen. And I don't want to ever be guilty of being unthankful. Because that's one of the greatest sins in America. You know why? You're, if you're not thankful for your freedom, you'll take it for you'll take it for granted. If you're not thankful for the people God puts in your life, you'll take it for granted. If you're not thankful for the Word of God, you'll never read it. If you're not thankful for prayer, you'll never pray. If you're not thankful for salvation, you'll not live like you are. If you're not thankful for the blessing of God, you'll think you and you. You know what you'll think? You think somebody owes you. Do you want to prove the generation is unthankful? A lot of them out there think everybody owes them something. You know why they're lazy and they won't go to work? Because they're unthankful. They think the government ought to give them a check so they can mm -hmm. sit on their blessed assurance and do nothing. They can sit there and get fat and unhealthy. No, it doesn't make any sense. What well, does? If you're a devil, it makes sense. Because if I pay you money to sit home and do nothing and, and to sit on your fat keister and eat a bunch of food and get fat, then all of a sudden now I'm basically paying for you to die so I can get you off the system. Think about it. I'm going to give you all the food stamps you can handle. You're not going to be disciplined enough to go out and buy the right kind of food because you ain't disciplined enough to go get a job. Are y'all listening to me? Right. And so because of that, think about how smart this is. If I just keep feeding you and I keep providing for you, you're never you're going to be motivated not to do anything, and now you're unthankful. And so guess what you're going to do? You're not going to be thankful and say, I'm going to use this to get on my feet and go do what I need to do. You're going to say, oh, this is great. And now all of a sudden you've got health problems. Now listen to me. You got help from them. And then they go down to the doctor. And the government says, oh, yeah, we're going to put them on this and help them this. And pretty soon they die off. And you know what the government said? Now we got money back. You say, that's crazy. Is that too, is that too deep for y'all? Mm -hmm. You know what creates all that? One thing. Unthankfulness. That's right. Because I'm telling you something. I don't want nobody handing me nothing. It takes a lot of humility. I don't like, I don't like being on this side of things. Because most of my life, Brother James, I've been over here. Where I've been able to get and get. And I still do, but I'm in a different boat than I was then. Also, I've learned how to obey and I've learned how to bound. Amen. But, but thankfulness is what makes it. I'm not, are, are we living in an unthankful generation? Go hand somebody something. Just walk up to a random, somebody in this generation and hand them a $20 bill out of the blue. Just walk, I'll pr try it. Try it. Find somebody today. Walk up to somebody that you've never seen in your life. Somebody that looks like they're part of this generation. And just walking around. You can see in their eyes. They're pretty much aimless. You just go up to them and hand them a twenty dollar bill. Say, here you go. I just want to give you something today. See how many of them don't look at you and say thank you. You're like, cool. And never turn back. You know how? I, there's another principle. Jesus said, were there not uh, how many lepers cleansed? Weren't there ten lepers right. cleansed? Ten. How many came back and said thank you? One. Huh? One. One. He said, where's the other nine? Mm -hmm. In fact, I could preach on that a little while. Jesus was so blessed by that, he said, he just go on. He sent them down to the priest. Uh, that's a whole other message. Mm -hmm. But because of the gratitude, he didn't even have to go down there. He went to the right source. They're unthankful. He said, they're unthankful. Do you know what else they are? They're unholy. Our generation is unholy. You can't tell the difference between a child of God and a child of hell. They're unholy. They're just blended in. They're without natural affection. What generation are we in? They, they love their dogs more than they love people. I, I, somebody made a statement the other day, and I agree with it wholeheartedly. They put their animals before they put other people. They'll starve to death to make sure that dog's got food and shots and all that. I'm just saying, nothing wrong with having pets. Nothing wrong with doing things like that. But when, when it becomes a, a unnatural affection, amen. There, not, that, not only that, it goes from all the way from that. Have you ever seen people and the way they act with, with, with things that are not natural? 
Not only that, how many mothers have killed their children, drowned them in a bathtub, set them on fire? That's not natural affection. Okay, and it goes all the way from that. It goes all the way as simple from a pet to, to sodomy. That, that natural affection is a big, broad scope. You understand that? Yes. Right. It's a broad scope. Without natural affection, truce breakers, they can't keep their word. Hmm. False accusers. Oh, my goodness. I've been falsely accused the last three weeks more than I have in a year. False accusers. Yeah. That's what generation we're living in. Yeah. Incontinent, fierce, despisers. And listen to this. This generation, they despise those that are good. Yeah. Those of us that do good according to the word of God, the people that are of this generation, they despise us. It's not because we're doing wrong. It's because we're doing right. right. They despise those that are good. Hey, it says this. They're traitors. They're heady. They're high-minded. <clears throat> lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. <clears throat> having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Those are the perilous times our generation is in on. Now, lastly, let me finish this message with this. We've noticed the man. We've noticed his generation. We have noticed our generation. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the key. We're talking about the beginning of righteous men in wicked generations. How do we, in this wicked generation, how do we become righteous? How, what does it take? Mm -hmm. That's the key. If there's no application, we might as well go home. Mm -hmm. What does it take for us to be righteous in this wicked generation. Number one, we must turn from those sins that are mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Those sins, those perilous times, those sins. The only way that we can be righteous in a wicked generation is to turn from them because we read and quoted from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, the first part of verse 5. Mm -hmm. The second part of verse 5, after he lists all those sins, those perilous times, you know what he says? From right. such turn right. away. Right. From what? From lovers of their own selves, from men that are that way, from covetous people, boasters, proud, the whole list. From such, there's that list of perilous times, there's that list of sins. He said, from such, turn away. You know what that tells me, Brother James? I can't fellowship with that crowd. Mm -hmm. And until they're not in that crowd, I will not fellowship with them. In fact, so much so, he didn't say, he didn't say, oh, just hold your hand and stay in a distance. No, in fact, he mm -hmm. said, turn away. Mm -hmm. Just turn away from them and let them be in their sin. Now, that's hard. That doesn't mean I don't love them. I'm going to give them the truth, but they're right. already to the place they are not going to listen. Now, if they can be saved, they've got to repent. Right. But I'm supposed to turn away from them. Because if I don't, they're going to take me out. Yeah. And if I'm supposed to be righteous in a wicked generation, what did Noah do? He had a wicked generation. What did he do? He turned away from them and built the ark. Mm -hmm. Now, they could have been saved. Why right. was the building in prison? Right. They could have repented, but they didn't. Hey, while I'm turning away from them, I'm still preaching. I'm still building, still walking with God, still trying to be right. They can get right, but I'm going to turn away from them. But that's how we become righteous in a wicked generation. You've got to turn away. Yeah. Not only that, we turn away from the sins mentioned. Number two, we must contend for the faith. That word contend has to do with contention. That's not the defense. Right. We're not to stand in defense. You know that song, Hold the Fort? I really love that song. But that's really not what we're commanded to do. Holding the fort is just like you just stay in your place. When I played ball, I, when I was young, I played a lot of different positions. When I got older, I played kind of a, a fullback, running back type position. And so that was a little different. But there were times as a run, as a fullback or as a running back, you know what I did? I didn't carry the ball near as much as I did block. Mm -hmm. That's part of the job of a fullback is to block whoever's going to take the ball or block for the quarterback. I, now, there's a lot of times I got the ball. But see, the thing about the fullback is everybody thinks he's just there to block. And so when you do get the ball, they're not really expecting it if you play it right. And they're thinking you're just going to block. And they say, you know, you go around the outside. But you know what they would tell me to do at times, son? Uh, you, you just stand your position and don't move. Don't worry about anybody else. You've got one man, and that's your job. And when he comes, you knock him on his keister. I'm just standing and blocking. You know what that is? That's really defense. But boy, when I was running the ball, buddy, I put my head down. I'm going to put my head between your numbers and drive you 10 yards back. That's my goal. Did it always happen? No. But sometimes it did. But you know what I do? Get up and do it again. Contention is I'm on the offense. I'm coming at you. I've got a sword. Now listen, we got a lot of generation people that's saved by the grace of God. They're just happy just to be here in life. He said, if you, want to, if you want to be righteous in a wicked generation, you have to turn from those sins, but you have to contend for the faith. That's what Jude said. Contend. Use that sword. Yeah. Go after the enemy. Don't wait for the enemy to come after you. Yeah. He said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's Jude, verse 3. Not only that, don't be worldly. 
You're going to be a righteous and a wicked generation? You cannot be worldly. He said, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. The Bible says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4, 4. And of course, 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For thee, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. They're going to be destroyed by judgment, just like Noah's world, just like his generation. They will pass away. Don't be of them. He said, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That's how you can be righteous in a wicked generation. Right. And you know what else you need to do? Find grace like Noah did in the sight of God. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 8. The Bible says grace is... Here's how you find grace. If you're going to be righteous in a wicked generation, you're going to have to find grace. And here's how you find it. It is given to the humble. Grace is given to the humble. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James 4, 6. Grace is given to the humble. Number two, great, it's, it's by grace that we are saved. You are going to have to be saved by the grace of God to be righteous in a wicked generation. You know what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And number three, grace. You need to understand something about grace. If you're going to find grace like Noah did, you're going to have to rest in the fact that God's grace is enough. It's sufficient. God's grace is sufficient enough, son, to keep me righteous in a right. wicked generation. Amen. It's not me. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His grace. It's by His grace. His grace is sufficient to help me not become like a wicked generation that I live in. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, now listen to this, my strength, God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. Do you know why a lot of people never experience the strength of God? Boy, that's good. I can preach two hours right there. Do you know why a lot of believers never experience the strength of God? Because they're too proud to be weak. Because Paul said, his strength. Now, wait a minute. Do you want to live on your strength or do you want to live on his strength? Mm. Do you think your strength will keep you righteous in a wicked generation? No. It won't. Mm -hmm. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take his strength. Amen. His strength is what's going to carry you. Do you realize the only way that his strength is made perfect in your life is by your own willingness to be weak? Now, think about that. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. Amen. Most gladly, he said, most gladly, that's a good attitude, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Why would you do that, Paul? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's the strength of God. Amen. If I'm going to be righteous in a wicked generation, can I just tell you, I'm going to need to have the power of Christ upon me. Therefore, whatever God brings me to the point of weakness, I'm going to have to gladly rejoice in that because I know that God's doing that, not so that he can hurt me, not so that he can destroy me. He's doing that so that he might manifest his true strength and his power in my life. And I'm going to tell you something, you don't need that. You don't need that. Question.